We are live. Good morning. It is Tuesday, 11 October, year of our Lord, 2022, and we're about to get started with a new uh, lesson in personal finance for the students of personal finance at the Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston. So I'm going to jump into my uh, Zoom and admit those students who are waiting. And I will say hello. And if you are joining by Zoom, if you could please just give me a sound check. Let me know that we're good to go with the audio. Anyone? Welcome, welcome, welcome. You can hear me? Thank you very much, Jessica. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, as usual, if you'll just pop in your name and the time that you got here, that would be awesome. I'll save that little text in case I ever get audited by the University of Houston asking if I'm keeping track of who is attending the live Zoom meetings. Obviously, you don't have to be here. This is an asynchronous course, and this is being uh, posted live to Facebook and the YouTube so I had an interesting question. We're a few minutes early, so this is my opportunity to ramble while we wait for folks to log in. But I had an interesting question from a student this week in an assignment. Uh, the student told me that he was unaware that we had Zoom meetings. <laughs> the Zoom meetings are actually required. This is like the lecture. Um, and so I try to talk about things in the Zoom meeting that will be helpful to you. And so today I'm going to try to do that. And just FYI, today I'm going to highlight, I've, I was out of, out of town last week in Michigan at uh, Mackinac Island with my mother and some of my family. It was pretty awesome. But I did get a little bit behind in terms of grading and interacting. So some of you had to wait for replies and emails, but most of you, almost all of you, uh, needed nothing from me because you're way ahead of the game. And I really appreciate that. Those of you who have, I don't know, I'd say over, over 300 points, um, you're doing great. Most of you are doing great. There are some laggards, as uh, is the case typically in any group. Uh, I was a laggard in college. I waited until the last minute. I did the least amount of work possible to get the grade. And then I complained if I didn't get a decent grade. That was kind of my game in college. I figured out over time that that didn't work out very well. So I discovered that doing the work and getting it done early is actually a very effective way to be successful in life and certainly in financial planning, uh, financial success. So I want to cover a couple of things since I've been away. I want to just do a kind of a re-review of the capstone assignment before we jump into insurance. So let me just give you kind of a heads up. Um, we started out with the missional or the credit crush part one. Um, so that was your, you know, that was one assignment where you actually set up the um, the items that would be in your plan that are in your plan, your debt, your house, your car and a credit card. And I wanted you to create those imaginary debts for a, a number of reasons. And one of the reasons was I wanted you to do some research to figure out based on the job that you're going to get or that you hope to get, uh, based on the income that you could expect, if you get the job that you want in your industry, in your major, um, how much would your income be? So you were supposed to do some research. And again, most of you did this. Most of you are way ahead of the game. But there's a group of students who are still just kind of missing the main point. So once you did that, once you went and discovered, did a little research to figure out how much income you would kind of expect if you get the job that you want to get when you graduate, then your job was to go and see how much house could you afford 
what would be a reasonable amount for you to pay for a mortgage? And then you were supposed to pick your house and, and figure out how much is interest rates? How, what are the interest rates right now? And what could you get a loan for? These are all very easy things to get with a little bit of research and a little bit of work. So again, most of you did a great job so far throughout this kind of mini series, the credit crush, um, which started with some research and you figuring out what your financial life could look like after you graduate. So if you missed all that and you're behind and you're getting deductions and you're just kind of feeling like you're not sure where we are, I would encourage you to go back and watch each of the Zoom meetings and just start over basically because we're getting we're getting closer and closer to the capstone assignment and I want to make sure today uh, it's still only 10:02 a.m. so for those of you who are here on time early you're getting a little extra heads up a little extra warning and I know you don't need it it's the students who aren't here who need it who need to be watching these zoom meetings uh, but but there's going to be a 100 point deduction for all of the students who miss what I'm about to talk about okay so I am posting this week uh, this video, this live stream video, this lecture, which is really going to be about insurance. But before we move on to insurance, I want to make absolutely sure that that I uh, clearly communicate what I'm seeing related to your uh, credit crush assignment. Because recall, remember that your capstone assignment, which is worth 200 points, that capstone assignment is really just a, uh, a um, putting it all together, each of the assignments that you're going to do this semester uh, that relate to your financial plan. You're building your financial plan. And so each of the assignments that you do throughout the semester are really what your capstone assignment is. So for most of you, your capstone assignment is getting completed as we go, and it's going to be great. But for some, you're, you're going to get a surprise. You're going to get hammered on your capstone assignment, which is worth 200 points. You're going to get hammered with a 100-point deduction if you miss these two important numbers. So that's what I'm trying to highlight, to give you a warning, to give you a heads up. And I hope that for those students who are not here and don't watch this video, I hope that those of you who do are kind enough and generous enough to just share that and group me that, hey, heads up, go watch that Zoom meeting, uh, because that's where the professor warned us that we're going to get hammered on the capstone assignment if we miss these two numbers. So I'm going to just go over the two numbers real quick there. It's in this post. Uh, there's a link in the video. Um, and it's if you just go to missionalmoney.com, it's the post that I posted today under the category assignments. So there are two numbers that I'm going to be looking at in your capstone assignment. These two numbers are just pretty basic, important. They're like the key numbers. Uh, one of them is what? how much money do you have left in your plan at your retirement? So you're going to, you've already put in a retirement date. Like, do you want to retire when you're 60, 65, 50, 70, whatever it is? And how long do you expect to live? If you live to be 95, your plan is going to have an ending value. So it assumes that you lived until the ripe old age of, let's say, 100 or 95. And you had certain expenses, certain goals, certain things you were spending money on. And you had certain income. And you had some investments that were producing returns. So based on all of that information, you're going to have a probability of success. But you're also going to have an ending value in your financial plan. And so we're going to be talking about that as we move forward. But I just want to give you a heads up that that ending value in your financial plan, if that value is over $5 million, then you need to go back and take another closer look at, that pl at your plan. And you need to at least explain why you have so much money left over. 
So that's if it's you know if you have a million or two million dollars at the end of your plan. Assuming you're starting when you're very young and you're doing all the things I'm teaching you to do, then that's pretty normal to have. I mean, think about it in 30 years or 35 or 40 years when you're well, even more than that, say 50 years from now, if you're 25 years old and you live to be 75, that's only that's 50 years if you only live to be 75. So think about it. If we fast forwarded the clock that far into the future and if you're doing the things I'm teaching you to do and you do actually become a millionaire by the time you're 50, then we would expect that that value of your plan to go up and up and up significantly if you're following the basic ideas that I'm teaching you uh, for building wealth. And so two million, three million, four million, I'm that's that's pretty good. That's not unreasonable. It's not unrealistic. However, if you've got five, six, or a hundred million dollars at the end of your plan, I mean, the problem is when we get to the capstone assignment, some students are going to be submitting their capstone assignment and they're not even going to comment on the fact that they have $100 million left in their plan. Now, if that happens and you're one of those students, I feel really bad because I feel like I didn't teach you much because you didn't even say anything, you didn't comment on it, you didn't even notice that unreasonable, unrealistic, ridiculous amount of money left in your plan. So that's the first number, your ending plan value. Pay attention to that. Now, I'm not asking you to become an expert financial planner. I'm not asking you to learn this software inside and out. I am just asking you to pay attention to the numbers. And if you have an excessive amount, you need to take another look at your plan. Chances are your expenses are too low. Your income's too high. Your return on investment's too high. There's something in your plan that's just a little out of whack. And if you have a hundred million or a billion dollars left in your plan, there's some something really out of whack. That's the first number is your ending value. Just pay attention to that. So I'll help you if you have an issue and you can't figure it out. You just reach out, start with GroupMe, um, you know, spend some time in your plan. But if you need help, I'll be happy to do some tutorials and help you because there's generally a couple of key things that you're missing that I'm happy to help you with. But if you're just not paying attention then I would suggest you pay attention because that's key in anything that relates to learning. And financial planning is a learning process. So that's number one is the ending value. Now here we have the debt strategy of one student. This was actual assignment that was turned in this week. And so I want you to look at that number. I want you to just think about that number. Do you see that number? Can someone just chime into the chat and just let me know that you see that number? Like, what is that number? It's on the screen. So if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, this would be a good time for you to chime in, leave a comment. Let me know you're watching uh, so that I know you're watching. Yes, Tika, that's the number. Can you tell me what that number is? I mean, you put the number in and you did it correctly. You can see it. It is the total savings. Yes, that's right, Karen. Isn't that the money that otherwise would have gone to debt if you only paid minimum payments? That is, yes, technically correct. So I'm just going to wait and hope that as you kind of look at that number, you think about what that number is. And you're right, that number in this plan and this student's financial plan represents, um, that's how much this student would save over their lifetime if they used uh, a better, more effective strategy. But we're looking at a number here and I'm hoping someone can tell me why this number is so alarming. It means you'll save that much money if you use debt payment strategies efficiently. Elisa, that's, it's right, but you're kind of missing the point. 
in this particular number. If this was your plan, I'm hoping that you would look at that and you would pause and you'd say, wait, what? It's a, Tika, yeah, it's a super excessive amount, way beyond the normal, way beyond reality. And so what is that number? Can somebody tell me in words, not numbers, but in words, how much money that is? How much savings does this student represent in their plan? Yeah, Lisa, $12 billion. Now, I would hope that every single one of you would look at that number and go, that's redonkulous. It's just absolutely redonkulous. So it is redonkulous. Redonkulous means it's way out of whack. So I want to just tell you how you can identify really quickly uh, if you have this issue going on in your plan. Now, just so you know, I did not give deductions in the capstone assignment for having these numbers be out of whack because what I wanted you to do in the capstone assignment was I asked you to give me this most important screenshot, which you did. Whoop. And that's great. Um, you know, that's you did. You all did that. And that's great because I told you to do this. Now I'm telling you something extra. And that is when you do your capstone assignment, you need to go back and do a little bit more research and pay a little closer attention to figure out why you have that huge slope up that big ski ramp. Because what that what that means is you have a loan that has a really ridiculous minimum payment based on the total amount of the balance. So yes, that's what happens. That's how credit card companies get you. But if this is your number, there's something wrong with your plan. There's just no way that's anywhere close to reality. So when you look at your credit card uh, entry, your data card, your data card for your credit card or your car loan or your mortgage, you should be thinking about, okay, is this realistic? Like, is this payment realistic. Where are you getting that number? And just do a little research and make sure that you're using. Some, I, and I know many of you are making up numbers and that's fine. But if you're making up numbers and you end up with this result, you want to go back and make up some new numbers. OK, so that's number one. Number two is that's that's the debt strategy. That's number two, really. The first one is the ending value. So I'm just going to like leave that out there and let you know that, again, if you have questions as we move forward to the capstone assignment, it's on you to ask those questions, to pay attention to these two numbers, and to make sure that you're comfortable that they're within the realm of reality, okay? This one is absolutely not. And so if you turn this in on your capstone assignment, for this one number, you'll get a 50-point deduction. If you turn this in with an ending value of, you know, $300 million, that's another 50-point deduction. I'm not even going to grade your capstone. I mean, I'll look for other things, make sure you include all the elements that are required. But if you are a student who's already done some assignments, they're in the can and you just grab them and throw them into your capstone without looking at these numbers, I'm telling you, you're going to get a 50% whack on your capstone assignment. So you've been warned. So please just pay attention to that. And I'm sorry for those of you who are already paying attention, already doing a great job, and you don't need me to be preaching this sermon to you. This is really for a relatively small number of students. But I really want to make sure everyone understands that these numbers matter. And I want you to pay attention to your numbers and your plan and just be thoughtful about the amount, because I know we're making up numbers because we're doing some research trying to forecast what your financial life will look like, and we're using your financial plan to do that. And I know that is, you know, it's going to require a little imagination, and it's going to require also just some attention to details. So I'm not looking for perfection by any stretch. These numbers can be, you know, pretty wide, but I want you to be aware and paying attention to the numbers in your plan. Okay, so that's that. Any questions? I'm looking for 
Uh, yeah, Julie says, maybe this is Elon Musk's account. You know what? If it was, then we'd be talking about reality. But again, whose plan is it and what is your plan based on? Think about that. I mean, let's be serious for a minute. It's funny. It could be Elon Musk's plan. And you may, let's say that you, I'll tell you a quick story. I had a student, uh, it was like my, it might have been my first year teaching this course. And I did the same assignment. I asked the students to do a little research, figure out how much they're going to make at when they graduate and, you know, do a little financial planning around that number. And I had a student, uh, a female student from Russia. She was pretty remarkable, um, but when she did her assignment, she gave me a $250,000 a year income, and her plan ended up with a redonkulous amount at the end. And so I pushed back, and I, I gave her a deduction, and I said, that's just not realistic. Well, this particular student wasn't Elon Musk, but she was close. She wrote back and said, I'm sorry, Professor, I... I I don't know what to tell you, but I'm actually making that much money now. <laughs> so she was she spoke six languages. She was uh, because of her skill set. She had already been placed into a unique position with a company where she made a ridiculous amount of money. In my opinion, she made a lot of money and she was only going to college because it well, because she liked education. But my point is she already had the job. I don't know if she's actually working yet, but it was like, this is how much I'm going to get paid when I graduate. It's not a made up number. So whether you're Elon Musk or this particular student, if that's your case, you just need to tell me, right? If it's a real number, I'm okay with that. But if you're just, you know, if you're just putting in numbers and you're not even aware that you have a hundred million dollars in your plan, then that's a problem. I failed as your instructor in personal finance. Those numbers matter. So thank you again. I have a question right now on my right capital portal. It shows that my plan has a zero percent uh, probability of success. Is that normal at this point in the process or is there something I need to look at? Julie, that's a great question. And you do need to look at it. That's um, at this point, at this stage, it's not a real problem, but it's definitely something we're going to be working on because we want your plan to be based on as close to reality as we can assume in terms of the research we're doing. But when we get when we get down to making sure that your income is correct and your expenses are relatively correct, then your plan should have a much higher probability of success. We're looking for something uh, north of 80% probability of success. We're not looking for 100%. In fact, if you have 100% probability of success, you probably also have that redonkulous ending value over 100 million or over 5 million. And that is just basically because you put in, oh, I'm going to make more money and I'm going to spend less money. And you made up some numbers that are probably not really based on reality. But yes, 0% probability of success would be the other extreme where you're not showing enough income, you're not showing enough investment for the future, uh, and you're probably overstating your expenses. So we will get there. It's not a problem right now, but by the time you do your capstone, it will be a problem. So still have the mortgage issue of paying it off soon. So Jessica, I think, um, did you set up a goal? So this is what has happened several times. It, it, look at your goals. If you have a goal to buy a second house, check that out, delete that goal. Because here's what happens in your financial plan. If you have a mortgage and then you go in your goals and you say, I'm going to buy another house. I'm going to move when, you know, in 10 years or five years or three years or whatever. I'm going to get another job. I'm going to move. Okay, great. Well, your plan is has got to pay off your original house. So check that. That's number one reason why this is happening, happening, Jessica, is you have 
put in a goal that says you want to move and your plan has no other option but to sell the original house. So check that out. If you still have problems, shoot me an email or um, you're, you might work with another student to try to figure it out. But if you can't figure it out, I'm happy to help. Good question. Thank you for that. Yep, check that out. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's jump into... So I'm pretty much... I just wanted to set the table for the capstone and make you aware that while I'm being very generous, I think... I mean, I'm trying to get you to learn how to use this program and learn how to build your plan as we go. And I'm not that critical in terms of deductions on uh, mistakes that you might make. And I've certainly not required that you pay attention to the numbers. I just want you to see how they work. And you've demonstrated that you absolutely understand that there's a difference in terms of how you pay off debt. You can pay the highest interest, the smallest balance, or you can just pay them all equally. And I want you to go back and play with that, those strategies again. Most of you, when you did the credit crush assignment, most of you did not add any extra money to go towards paying off your debt. And that's an important, and by next semester, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add another screenshot where you have to go in and say, uh, you know, some dollar amount that you pay extra towards your loans. Because if you really want to get out of debt, not only do you use a different strategy where you pay the highest interest first or the smallest account value first, not only do you apply those strategies, but you also go ahead and throw a little extra money at it. And then your strategy starts to show even more fruit even more benefit. So um, most of you, very few of you, in fact, I can't recall one student who added extra dollars per month, and that's really easy to do. So you can see that when you go back into your debt strategy, you click that drop down window. I could show you now, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave it at that. So that is our review for the credit crush uh, and the heads up for the capstone assignment, those two numbers that you need to be aware of. If you joined us late uh, or you were maybe watching Netflix while I was talking, go back, rewind. And by the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, I don't know about you, but I can listen a lot faster than I can talk. In fact, I can listen faster than you can talk. And so for that reason, I love that little playback speed button on YouTube where I can actually watch it in half the time uh, because I don't think I talk that fast. And I'm pretty sure you can watch me talk at half the time. So there's no excuse to miss the Zoom meetings if you can watch a one-hour Zoom meeting in 30 minutes for a three-hour, three-credit hour class. So thanks. Okay, now let's talk about insurance. Uh, just... Oh, cool. Jessica, that fixed it. Awesome. So that was the answer. That's typically the answer if your mortgage is being paid off and you're, you're like, why is it being paid off? It's because you set a, a goal to move. And when you move, the original mortgage has to get paid off. So your plan will automatically just pay that off, assuming that you you know, sold that house and bought another house because that's the goal you put into your plan. So great. Thanks for that, Jessica. Okay, so this week and next week, we're going to talk about insurance. And uh, as we get started on insurance, I want to just say that insurance is one of those topics that is, well, kind of important. It's important for a number of reasons. Um, insurance is important in the context of this course, uh, personal finance, because insurance is a category in your budget, in your spending plan. Insurance is one of those things you're going to spend money on. And insurance is one of those things that, frankly, you're going to spend a lot of money on, depending on how much stuff you own. For example, if you own a house or a car, 
you're going to pay insurance on those because those assets are something that you want to protect. And in the and, and with a house or a car, really the best way that we've come up with protecting those assets is through something we call insurance. And insurance is designed to transfer risk. It transfers risk from you to your insurance company. And transferring risk costs money because why would the insurance company take the risk of replacing your assets without getting paid for that. So there's a lot of uh, science that goes into insurance, uh, science meaning actuarial numbers, the law of large numbers. How do we rate? How do we charge the, the insurance company? I used to be a State Farm agent for many years. So when I say we, sometimes I'm pretending I'm the insurance company. So how do we, the insurance company, charge you, the consumer, the right amount of money uh, so that, you know, your insurance rates are not too high and not too low? If they're too low, we don't stay in business. We being State Farm, Allstate, whatever the insurance company is. Uh, if they're too high, then you're going to go down the street and buy your insurance from someone else. So there are so many things that affect the price of insurance, but the main idea is that you're transferring risk to the insurance company. And so risk and risk management is really one of the key elements of financial planning. And in the context of personal finance, there are seven elements uh, of financial planning. I'm going to bounce through them pretty quick. I wish I had a picture. I should have a picture. Maybe not. Um, I have a in my book, Make Your Money Count, I use a picture of a tick. Do you know what a tick looks like? You know, a tick, the thing that sucks your blood and you pick it up if you walk through the woods. A tick, free tick. And it's a picture of a tick with a... Uh, um, iron ball around its ankle. Free tick is an acronym. Okay, it's a word. Free tick. F-R-E-E-T-I-C. It's how I, uh, in my book, it's how I teach the seven elements of financial planning. So I'm just going to jump through them pretty quick uh, because I want you to see where risk management sits. And I want you to understand the seven elements of financial planning. So you can write these down if you want. Free tick. F is for financial independence. And some people would say retirement. Retirement is a major element of financial planning. But the purpose of retirement planning, typically for most people, is to achieve financial independence so that they can have a sense of uh, contentment in their financial life without worrying about having to work. Financial independence is the F for free tick. Risk management is the R. And that really relates to insurance. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the rest of them, free tick. Uh, the next E, e <clears throat> excuse me, the next E is education funding. How do we prepare for and fund college for our kids and our grandkids? That's a major element. One of the seven elements of financial planning is education funding or education planning. The next one is a really important one, one that we don't really talk about in this course at all. In fact, I had a student this week ask about why don't I have estate planning tab available in my plan? And that's because we just don't give it to you because it's beyond the scope of this course, but it's not beyond the scope of financial planning. In fact, it's a critical, very important, often overlooked element of financial planning. That's your will, your estate. How will your assets be distributed after your death? And estate planning also includes things like if you get sick or hurt and you can't, you don't have the mental capacity to manage your financial stuff. You need a financial power of attorney. You need a, a medical power of attorney. Something, a document written out by an attorney that says, here's my wishes in the event that I'm on life support or I'm on a, if it doesn't look like I'm going to survive. So all of those things, end of life things, are done through the element of estate planning. Uh, again, one of the seven very important elements of financial planning. So free tick, F-R-E-E, -E, we've gone through the free. 
financial independence, risk management, education planning, and estate planning. And then we get into the TIC, the T-I-C. So T, what do you think T stands for? I'm sure there's an accounting major on the call today. Uh, what do you think the T stands for? Tax, Julie, you get the extra thousand points today. Just kidding. That's great. That's right. Tax planning. And I think I told you I was born on April 15th. My first, that's tax day, by the way. My first child was born on December 31st, just before midnight, which means even though I never changed a diaper, my wife and I didn't have to spend one dime on feeding our son who was born on December 31st. We received a tax deduction for the entire year. And so because I was born on April 15th, I planned that exactly so that we would have that benefit. Yeah, right. I just got lucky. But my second son was born on October 15th, which is coming up. His birthday is coming up. But October 15th is the tax deadline for corporations. I think it falls on, I think the 15th is Saturday, so it'll be the following Monday. But at any rate, tax planning is critical. Three laws of personal finance, the law of spending and savings. Uh, yeah, the law of spending and savings. Spend less than you earn so you can save more for what matters most. That's the first law of personal finance. And the second law is the law of tax advantaged investing. And it falls under this category, one of these seven elements of financial planning, which is uh, tax planning. So what do you think the next one is? The I. T, I, and C. T, I, tax planning, and I. What do you think the I stands for? Any guesses? Julie got the tax. She got the thousand point imaginary points. Investment. Yes, Elisa, that's right. It, Julie, insurance could be, but we're saying insurance is risk management. So insurance, risk management, that's that category. But yeah, it's invest, investment planning. Which, by the way, is the most popular topic in this course. And after we do insurance, we're jumping into investment planning. And I'll teach you four strategies, four investment strategies that are designed to help you maximize returns and minimize risk. And these four strategies are really important for you to know. They're very simple. They work very well, incredibly well. And I'm going to teach those to you in a week or two. Um, so that's investment planning that's coming very soon. And that's where you're going to start to work your plan to work investing into your financial plan so that you get to see how it works and how it impacts the outcome of your plan. So lots to cover in investing. And it's, again, one of the most, it is the most uh, popular topic. So we did free TI. F is <clears throat> financial independence or retirement planning. R is risk management or insurance planning. E, education planning. The second E is estate planning. T is tax pl planning. Uh, and then I is investment planning. What do you think the C stands for in free tick? It's, um, it could be a B, but that didn't work f for the picture that I wanted my illustrator to draw. Free tick. We use the C is for any guesses going once, going twice, going three times. Nobody can guess what the C stands for in free tick. And so capital, that's a good guess, Elisa, but nope, it's cash flow. So another word for budgeting or spending plans, but cash flows, if you look in your plan, you'll see there's a lot of space in your financial plan to look at cash flows, whether you're talking about debt management strategies or your retirement planning, uh, cash flows are really critical to financial planning. So we pay a lot of attention to cash flow. And so that's the seventh and one of the very important. It could be, these are not in order of importance. If they were, cash flow would probably have to be number one. Um, but at any rate, those are the seven elements of financial planning. Uh, free tick. Now let's get back to insurance. Insurance is expensive. And it's really, 
I, you could say it's complicated. I mean, a lot of people think it's complicated. And I, I think a lot of people think it's boring. Um, but I think it's pretty interesting. I spent many years in the insurance industry. I was a state farm agent, but before that, I was a state farm claims adjuster. So I got to work all the major hurricanes, earthquakes, fires, floods. Oh man. And I, I really loved that job. It was the best job I ever had without a doubt in terms of being fun, engaging, learning stuff, and just uh, feeling like you're helping people. Um, I still have my adjusting license, but that's where I got my my experience in finding. In that's how I got into the uh, financial services business is by becoming a claims adjuster and then a State Farm agent and then a certified financial planner. So what we're going to do this week is your assignment this week for insurance is going to be to get a quote for car insurance. Now, some of you already have insurance, so we're going to talk a little bit about car insurance for a minute. Uh, and we're going to, you're going to, you're going to have to do some research, some work, some reading, uh, because there's just no way I can cover anywhere close to how much I would need to cover to make you an expert in insurance. You just can't do it. There's too much. Um, but my goal is to help you become uh, an effective consumer of insurance. And I think I can do that. I'm going to try my best. And to start with, I'm going to ask you to get a quote for your car insurance so that you can see how each of those coverages impact your cost. So remember, when you buy insurance, you're transferring risk to the insurance company. But there's lots and lots of ways to do that. In other words, there's lots of ways to configure your insurance policy so that you get uh, the best value for you. And when I say for you, your policy will probably be different than my policy. And so let's talk a little bit about car insurance in the context of your plan versus my plan. So to start with, I'm going to ask you to learn what are the coverages. Uh, and that's you're going to see that in Money Study Group. There are several articles that list these coverages, and I could go into great detail about any of this, but obviously we just don't have time to do that. But I want you to be familiar with what these coverages are. So I'm just scrolling through um, these coverages right now. And if you open your car insurance policy, you'll see all these things listed. And same with your homeowner's insurance. This, this post is really specific to home and auto insurance. So, and you'll see, you'll have more uh, content in money study groups so that you can get more familiar with uh, what is in your auto or car insurance policy. But let's start with some numbers. The first number is, uh, I want you to know about deductibles. Do, do you know what a deductible is? You're going to learn in the quiz this week. Uh, the insurance quiz is going to give you um, some some information about things like deductibles. So um, do you know what a deductible is? If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, go ahead and leave a sentence or two and tell me what you think a deductible is, how it works. Um, Julie says your maximum out of pocket. That's um, not exactly true. Now, in health insurance, I think it may be more accurate a statement, but we're talking about car and home. We're talking about property and casualty insurance. What is a deductible in relation to your home, your car, your business? What is a deductible? It's the amount of money we have to pay before they pay us. That is it. That is that is the definition. Uh out of pocket, you have to pay before the insurance company covers your expense. That is correct. So the deductible that you select on your policy is the amount that you uh, don't transfer to the insurance company. Remember, insurance is about transferring risk. So your deductible is the amount of risk that you keep. 
So what do you think that does to the price or what we call the premium in your insurance policy? If you select a deductible, either higher or lower, because you get lots of options when you buy an insurance policy, you can have a higher deductible or a lower deductible. And I want to see if you understand what that does to the premium. So the higher the deductible, so he says, the higher deductible, the cheaper the price. Exactly. Obviously, if you retain more of the risk, then you're going to get a lower premium. You're going to save money on your insurance policy. Now, what's the problem with that? What if you pick the highest possible deductible on your policy, whether it's your homeowner's policy or your auto policy? What's the problem with that in terms of personal finance and financial planning? What do you think you would need to be thinking about if you had a super high deductible? So we've established that what a deductible is. We've also established that if we have a higher deductible, we save more money on the premium. And naturally, if we have a lower deductible, we're going to pay a higher price for our insurance so that we we understand we all need to understand that but now my question is okay think like a certified financial planner if you are your own client and you have a super high deductible as a financial planner what questions might i ask to help you what questions might you ask yourself if you're acting as your own financial planner, what question is really important for you to know before you take on the risk of a super high deductible? So Tika says if you get into a financial bind, it can have a negative effect, uh, be unable to be paid. So, yeah, if you if you get into a financial bind, let's just say you have a house fire or you have an accident in your car that's your fault and the car gets totaled and you need that car to go to work and you have, a, say, a $2,000 deductible on a $10,000 car and now the car got totaled and it's undrivable and you have to replace it and now the insurance company is going to pay you how much? $10,000 car with a $2,000 deductible, what are they going to pay you, Tika? Or anyone, anyone can answer that. Yeah, they're going to pay you $8,000 because they're going to deduct your $2,000 deductible from the actual payment. And if we assume that the payment would be $10,000 and you have a $2,000 deductible, you're only going to get $8,000. And so in that situation, well, what if you owed 11000 on your car? Believe it or not, that happens. People can owe more money on their car than it's worth. It happens all the time. You go out, especially these days, you go out and buy a car uh, and you get a loan and the finance company is happy to lend you, you know, almost all of it with a very small down payment. Uh, and I don't know if you guys noticed this, but I've been buying used cars from f for 100 years. Well, not quite 100 years, but for a long time. And usually you can get a really good deal on a used car. But after COVID and supply chain issues and this, that, and the other thing, used and chip shortages, uh, used cars, the price of used cars has skyrocketed. It's starting to come down. But if I, and I did buy a car while it was skyrocketing because I just happened to need a car. I gave one to my daughter and I needed a replacement and I went and bought a car. So think about that for a minute, Tika. If I were to go and buy a car and I paid, uh, let's say that I paid 10000 for the car, kept a $2,000 deductible, I have to have this car. And now the car that I paid $10,000 for um, is only worth 5000 because when I bought the car, all those prices were super inflated, and now the prices have come down, but I have a loan for $10,000, and they're only going to pay me $5,000 to replace the car because now you can buy that same car for $5,000, half the price. 
half the price. So now how much am I going to get from my insurance company? If they can replace that car for $5,000, even though I have a $10,000 loan, and I'm making these numbers up, hopefully that doesn't happen to any of you in your lifetime. But it's a very realistic scenario in terms of inflation and the cost of the vehicle and the loan, because when you bought the car, you had to borrow enough money to pay for it. The prices of used cars was super high. And then two years later, when you have this accident, the value of the car has dropped significantly and you have a car that can be replaced now for 5000 but you owe 10000 How much are you going to get from your insurance company? in that scenario. Tika, do you have an answer? Anyone? Would you still have to pay $5,000 after they give you $5,000? Well, wait a minute. They didn't give you $5,000. If you bought the car, the same car that you paid $10,000 for when the prices were super high, and you borrowed $10,000, but today you can buy that same car for $5,000. So you can go out and buy that same car for $5,000. The problem is you borrowed $10,000. Now the insurance company is only going to pay how much it costs to replace the car. So they don't care that it cost $10,000 two years ago when prices were crazy off the charts. All they care about is what can I go buy that car for at CarMax today? And that's $5,000. So... Your original loan is still 10K. Yeah, you still have to pay that. But that's not the insurance company's deal. That's your deal with the, with the bank. Insurance company owes you for another car. So how much are they going to pay you? And again, we're using made up numbers. $2,000 deductible on a $5,000 car would be pretty silly. But this is why I want you guys to get a quote on your insurance and play with these numbers. Because one of the numbers you're going to play with is the deductible. You're going to have to ask yourself, as you always have to ask yourself, does this make sense? Is this worth it? If I have a really big deductible, how much am I going to save? Versus if I have a lower deductible, how much am I going to have to pay? And somewhere between the lowest deductible and the highest deductible is what I call the best bang for the buck. When I was a State Farm agent, that's what I was always trying to figure out. But if my client had no money in the bank, they had no emergency fund, they lived paycheck to paycheck, and they got in an accident, they need a very low deductible because they have done no financial planning and they want to drive the most expensive car they can they can drive, then they have to have a low deductible because they just don't have the room for a larger deductible. But again, yeah, oh, they would pay 3000 since the deductible is 2000 Exactly. And the insurance company, Tika, would only give $5,000 because that's what they can go buy that car for at CarMax. That's how your auto insurance works. Now, There are some companies where you can buy what's called a rider. Now, a rider is kind of an addition to the policy that gives you extra benefits and you pay extra money for it. But there, I think Liberty Insurance will pay, will allow you to put a rider on your policy so that they will cover your car for whatever the loan balance is. I think that's how it works, but it's a basic idea. Now, imagine if you're driving a car that you can replace for $5,000, but you have a $10,000 loan on that car. Now you're double dunked because you're going to have to pay insurance on a $10,000 vehicle when in reality you could replace the car for $5,000. Does that make sense? Uh, I don't think so, but you can do that um, with some companies. But most companies... Almost all of them uh, pay the what's called the actual cash value or, you know, you, you can even say the replacement cost for the car because they're going to replace it with a car just like the one you had. So that's how that works. So that's one reason I want you to do an auto insurance quote so that you can get familiar with the coverages and the deductible amounts. Okay, so now let's talk about coverages, and you're going you're gonna to get into this in your assignment this week, but um, there's two parts that I want you to be aware of in both home and auto policies. 
we're talking about property and casualty insurance. That's true for business insurance as well. So whether you're talking about your car that you drive, the house that you live in, or the business that you run, if you're a business owner and you own a, let's say you own an office building or one of my students this week, I, I forgot her name. I can, oh, I, I remember her name now. Uh, anyway, her family owns grocery stores. So if if you own the grocery store, you have to pay insurance for the building and you have to pay insurance. You want to have insurance on the inventory and you're going to want to have insurance probably on the cash, you know, the money that's coming in and going out. And if it gets stolen between the store and the bank, all of these things, every business has different exposures, but it's still property and casualty. We're not talking about life insurance. We're not talking about health insurance. We're just talking about one area of insurance, property and casualty. And all property and casualty insurance, all of those policies have two sections. The first section covers your property. The second section covers liability. And so I would love to spend two weeks teaching you about liability. But today, what I'm just going to do is set the table and help you know that when you get that insurance quote for your car, you're going to have two sections. One is your car. That's what the insurance company pays you in the event that your car is damaged in a covered loss. And you have section two, which is liability, which is what you would be obligated to pay in the event of an accident that was your fault. So I want you just to think about those two sections of the policy. They're very important. And if you're going to be a good consumer of insurance, you need to understand that all of your property and casualty policies, your insurance policies have two sections, property and liability. And you, as a consumer, need to know what those coverages are so that you can make informed decisions about how much coverage you select and about how much the deductible is going to be for the property side. Liability doesn't have a deductible. So in the event that we get in an accident and let's say it's my fault, let's say I'm texting while I'm driving and I run into you and I damage your car and I send you to the hospital. My policy is going to pay for your damage because it was my fault. And I'm not going to have a deductible because my policy and the laws in the state of Texas require me to make you whole, to pay for your loss. So there's no deductible. So now we go look at these coverages and you're going to see this when you get your insurance quote, all of these different options. And that's what I want you to pay attention to. I want you to learn what these coverages are and how much coverage you get. And the liability, you're going to notice there are three numbers. I'm going to just enlarge those. So when you do your quote, when you get your quote on auto insurance, you're going to see there's three numbers there. And I'm just going to, I'm going to highlight those numbers today and then we'll end it. We'll end today's lesson. Next week, I'll pick up on the other coverages in your, in your auto policy. I'll talk a little bit about those and I'll try to highlight your homeowner's insurance policy. And I will answer any questions that you submit uh, related to insurance. If you have questions, I'd love to spend a whole week on life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, health insurance. These are all very important elements in protecting your wealth insurance does that. It protects your assets. And one of the biggest assets you have, does anybody know, what's the most valuable asset you have? Hands down, without a doubt, always. The most valuable asset you have. Yeah, Tika, it's yourself. And part of that is because your health is part of that too, Julie, yeah. But the main thing is... Um, your earning capacity, if you're a 25, 30-year-old person who's in good health, who has certain skills, you've gone to college, the biggest asset you have, it's a financial asset, and it is the earning capacity of your lifetime. 
And so if that's true, think about how would you protect that asset with insurance? And there's a couple of ways to do that. I have a family. When I was younger, it was really important that I had enough life insurance so that if something happened to me, since I was the person who was going to provide for my family, my young children and my wife, that was my job. Now, that may not be the job today. That may not that may have changed in our culture overnight. But when I grew up, that was, you know, that was the ex- expectations. And I was happy to step up and say to my wife, I'll take care of you. I will be the breadwinner for the family. And she worked too, but I was the major breadwinner. My wife was a teacher. She taught at private schools. She didn't make enough money to justify the work she did. But the point is to protect that asset. I, my financial planning included buying some life insurance so that if I died and that asset was eliminated, my family would have that asset replaced, my income over my working lifetime. Another way to protect that asset is disability insurance. If I'm, you know, I was an auto mechanic for many years. So imagine if I had my hand cut off in an engine or if a transmission fell on my head and I couldn't walk or whatever. There's so many ways you can be injured in that business and not just in business. What if I'm snow skiing or the fact that I drive a motorcycle every day to work? So to protect my income, there's another thing called disability insurance. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to talk about all those types of insurance. I just want you to know that insurance is designed to transfer risk and every risk that you have, every financial asset in your life typically can be protected with insurance. And one of the things you have to do is you have to protect the other people because the law requires that you have liability protection on your car. If you're going to drive a car, you have to be financially responsible. But you don't have to you don't have to be as responsible as me, and that's what these numbers are. 100, 500, 100. I'm gonna go over them real quick, and I'm just gonna let you know that part of your assignment is to figure out in the state of Texas what is legally required. Like you have to have liability insurance, but you don't have to have 100, 500, 100. You could have a lower number. So what is the 100, 500, 100? Does anybody know? If you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, now's a good time for you to leave a comment and just tell me, what are those three numbers under Section 2, liability of your auto policy? There are three numbers. It's a coverage. Your liability coverage comes in three numbers. And I'm showing you 100, 500, 100, and I'm going to explain what that means. But does anybody know what those numbers are for? 100 slash 500 slash 100. So, Elisa, you're showing me some numbers. Yeah, they're dollar amounts. So 100,000, 500,000, 100,000. Yes, that is absolutely correct, Elisa. Thanks. But do you know what they cover? The first 100,000, the second 500,000, that's the second number, and the third number is 100,000. But each of those coverages have a different, they, they, Each of those different limits have a different, uh, one of them is for you causing the accident. The second is, I believe, due to someone else. No, that's not it, Tika. So here's how it goes. Liability is always about you causing the accident, you being responsible, you being at fault. Your insurance company is not going to pay any of these numbers unless you are at fault. So that's what liability is. It means you are at fault. So the first 100 is per person per accident. So let's say I get in an accident with a school bus and there's, say, 10 kids on the bus. And um, one of them, let's say it's a bad accident, and one of them, let's say one of them dies in the accident. In that case, my insurance policy is going to pay the limit for one person, which in this case is $100,000. But the second number is the aggregate for the entire claim. So $500,000, if there are 10 students, one of them died, 
that student, that one uh, person is going to get the limit on the policy, most likely, of $100,000. But then there's 400000 left for the other nine kids on the bus and then the bus driver as well. So let's say that they all go to the hospital and they all have $50,000 of hospital bills, just to keep it simple. That $500,000, it's only $400,000 now because we paid the $100,000 for the the kid that died. So somehow the insurance company is going to take $400,000 and they're going to pay the limit and they're going to pay it out. And then what's going to happen? There's going to be like, that would be $90,000 left over and you would be responsible for that $90,000 because see how that works? The one person that dies gets $100,000, but that is part of the 500,000. And then the leftover, the 400,000 is going to go to the nine people who each had $50,000 in damages in hospital bills. And that doesn't even include pain and suffering and ongoing surgeries. There could be much, much, much more depending on the injuries. So that just gives you an idea what those numbers are. 100,000 is for one person's injuries. 500,000 is for the entire claim. No matter how many people are involved, it's 500,000 for bodily injury total. The last number, that last $100,000 is for property damage, not for your car, not for your property. Remember, this is section two liability, which means that $100,000 is what your policy would pay to replace the property that was damaged as a result of your negligence. Does that make sense? So again, in this example, let's say it's one of Kamala Harris's favorite machines on the planet, an electric school bus. And that electric school bus costs $300,000 because the old school bus cost $100,000. But now you damaged, you destroyed, you totaled an electric school bus with all of its batteries. And so now that is a $300,000 vehicle because that's just the cost of being green. And so that's not enough insurance for you if you got in that particular accident. Now, 100, 500, 100 is a really good amount of insurance. And so what one of the things you're going to have to decide for your policy is uh, how much do you need? And the minimum in Texas is way lower than 100, 500, 100. So this week you're going to do that. Um, that's going to be your one of your, a big part of your assignment is to go and get a quote for insurance. Let me give you a couple of quick suggestions as you get the quote for your car insurance. Number one, if you already have insurance, uh, maybe you're on your parents' insurance policy. That's probably half of you. Um, the best way for you to do it is to call your insurance agent and tell them you want to get a quote. Just review the coverages, ask them to review the coverages with you and to give you a quote. And you can ask some questions like, how much would it cost if I raised the deductible? What if I lowered the deductible? What if I added rental coverage? Look at the coverages that are available and just think about what it would mean to you to have these coverages be better to upgrade them or maybe you don't need that much coverage maybe you already own three cars and you're paying for car rental and you don't need to have rental so just look at the coverages and do your best to understand what the coverages are and get a quote so that you can see how much it costs for these different coverages and if you already have coverage make a few changes and see what the what it does to the price Maybe you raise the deductible, maybe you lower it, maybe you increase your liability, maybe you reduce it. I hope you don't increase it. That's probably what you need to do. Anyway, that's it. So that's going to be your assignment this week. We'll come back next week and we'll talk more about insurance. Again, if you have questions about insurance, make sure you, you can email me, um, text me, and I'll keep a list and I'll answer those questions. One question I got this week, and I'll, I'll end with this. I think it was Ashley. I know it was Ashley. Great question. Uh, the question was, or, well, it wasn't a question. It was more of a comment. Like she thought it was odd that... Um, insurance, car insurance, costs more for guys than it does for girls. Does anybody know why that might be? I'm showing you a car. I drove this car. Actually, not this one, but one just like it. It's 
really hard to get into and out of, but it's super fast and fun to drive. <clears throat> but um, why do you think insurance costs more for young men than young women? Um, seemed discriminatory was, I think, her comment. Um, but there's a reason for that. Remember, insurance is based on the numbers. It's based on actuarial facts. Um, statistics, Julie says, statistics of accident rates. That's yes, that's true. Um, and not only number of accidents, but severity, injuries, fatalities. And when you think about injuries, when you think about accidents, just the number of accidents, guys versus girls, when you think about the severity of the accident in terms of injuries, when you think about the severity of the uh, injuries in terms of fatalities, just those three things, number of accidents, severity of injuries, and injuries that result in fatalities, those three things, who do you think is typically the cause of those kinds of accidents more guys or girls i mean some would say that guys are way better drivers than girls so why would they pay more for insurance others would say something else Alyssa says guy what does that mean guy a guy more likely to cause the accident more likely to have more severe injuries more likely to have fatal is that what you're saying Alyssa? that the guy is the the guy is the worst driver is that what you're saying like they're more likely to cause accidents. Okay, well, that's true. That's true. And that's why they pay more. But what do you think is the key ingredient for those accidents from the guys? And I'm showing you a picture that will kind of be a clue. Racing and sport cars. So, yeah, that's it. Speed is the word I'm looking for. Guys like to go fast. Typically, Girls aren't like my wife doesn't want to go fast. I like to go fast and I'm an old man. But when I was a young man, I like to go fast. And that's just kind of the deal. Now, that may have changed. Like I said, when I got married, I had certain ideals and certain things that mattered to me that may not matter today. <laughs> but most of the time, um, what we found in the statistics prove it is that guys drive faster than girls. And that speed is what creates the, the frequency of accidents and the uh, severity of the injuries and, most of all, the, the higher rate of fatalities. And so that's been a pretty standard, a pretty consistent statistic over the years. And that's why guys pay more for insurance. <clears throat> so... Um, that is it. I'm sorry I went long today, but I'm going to hang around. If you have any questions, I'll be here. I'm going to stay on the Zoom meeting. I'm going to jump over here and finish out the broadcast. So if you've been watching on Facebook or YouTube, thanks for joining us. Please leave a comment. You're welcome to like the video if you if you want to. If you're a student, you should subscribe to the channel um, so you get notifications when we post these videos. But I'm going to hit the finish button and say thank you for joining us on Facebook and YouTube.